name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And it is a pleasure and honor that we have an opportunity to celebrate this Red Mass, and for me in particular, early in my time as the Bishop of Rockford. This Mass is not only being celebrated here, but throughout the Diocese of Rockford. But how good it is and how grateful we are for the presence of so many of those for whom we are praying, the presence of Mayor Morrissey, the presence of police chiefs, the fire officials, the civic uh, officials who are here, and in a very special way, the judges and the lawyers who are here. We are grateful for your presence. We are grateful for this opportunity to pray for you and to thank you for all that you do for the common good. And you see just how port important this is. We are honored with the presence of Bishop Doran this morning. Bishop, thank you again for coming. And the turnout of the priests from this deanery, from this area. So all of this as a sign of just how important we see and consider this opportunity for the Red Mass to be. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to all my God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who have taught the hearts of the faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And let's be seated. The first reading is a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. As they rejoice before you, as at the harvest, as people make merry when dividing spoils. For the yoke that burdened them the pole on their shoulder and the rod of their taskmaster you have smashed is on the day of Midian. For every boot that trampled in battle, every cloak rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the flames. For a child is born to us, a son is given us, upon his shoulder dominion rests. They name him Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. His dominion is vast and forever peaceful, from David's throne and over his kingdom, which he confirms and sustains by judgment and justice, both now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. He who does 
A reading from the letter of James. Beloved, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show his works by a good life in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Wisdom of this kind does not come down from above, but is earthly unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every foul practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without inconstancy, or insincerity, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace for those who cultivate peace. The word of the Lord.
be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on the one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good, and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Once again, I wish to say how honored and proud we are to have so many of you here, not only our civic officials, the police, the fire, government of various positions and levels, our lawyers and our judges, but our faithful as well. And that we have such a gathering at noon on Friday is not without its significance, it's not without its sacrifice, and so I'm very grateful that we've been able to come together for this moment. We here at the cathedral and the diocese are proud and honored to be gathered for this Mass. The Red Mass is most often celebrated on this day in our liturgical calendar, which recalls the life of St. Thomas More, a lawyer, a judge, a statesman, who served as the Lord Chancellor in England under King Henry VIII in the early 1500s. And this is also a Mass of the Holy Spirit that is traditionally offered to pray for our judges and lawyers and other law enforcement, for the fire, the civic officials of all faiths. And so it's in this context, again, that I wish to offer that word of greeting to all of you who are gathered here. We're here as Catholic faithful, and we do pray for you. And that's a tradition of our faith that goes back to the earliest of times. St. Paul admonishes us that we are to pray for government leaders and for those who are in authority. But at a moment like this, I wonder if we sometimes take for granted how important it is that in this country we have such a developed and skilled and impartial judicial and legal system and system of justice across the board. Maybe some of you, like me, have visited or even lived in other countries outside of our own where this is not the case, where citizens could not rely upon the call to the police or an appeal to the judiciary to uphold their rights. And the result of that is a very different kind of life than we have here in the United States. It's a life characterized by daily uncertainty 
and even fear that fosters instability in personal relations and throughout society. And thanks be to God and to our Constitution, we have known better than that for more than 200 years. That respect for law and justice that is contributed to by so many of you here is a record for us to be proud of and perhaps even more to be grateful for. We are proud to pray for you, for all of you, and for our beloved country. And we do this as American citizens. As Catholics, we have a proud history of our contributions to the founding and the flowering of what has been the great American experiment in human dignity and human freedom. As you may recall, Charles Carroll, a Catholic, was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He served as a delegate to the Continental Congress and was the first senator from Maryland. Catholics served in the Continental Army during our revolution, and they've served honorably in the military ever since to defend our freedom. And many of you here today are witnesses to and examples of the Catholic participation in our legal, our legislative life, in so many of the forms and elements of service to our people that is associated with our government. So this afternoon celebrates the joining of two elements that have been essential to our faith. First, we embrace precisely the Christian and Catholic faith that is ours. Our first reading is the famous passage from Isaiah that says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Christ is that light. He is that gift for the whole world who helps us to break away from the darkness of what is not right, of what is not true, of what it is that oppresses. Our faith bears witness to the light, and by our words, by our example, by our persuasion, we embrace the light and show it to the world. We have been given a spiritual trust that cannot perish from the earth. At the same time, we are also American citizens, and we are proud of our American history. We have embraced the American experiment of freedom and respect for the rule of law. Our own history of combining our faith in the embrace of freedom and justice of our country mirrors the two and a half centuries of American history itself. We have been part of the combination of freedom and respect for conscience that has contributed to the social peace and the building up of the country that we love. The interplay, the mutual support between religious and civic values is at times admittedly delicate and even complicated. But our American experience and history has shown them to be not only compatible but essential together for the common good. We acknowledge this as Catholics even though in our history in this country we have at times suffered religious and ethnic discrimination and persecution. And despite this we've continued to hold to the greatness of our faith and of the protections given that faith by our American Constitution and the legal system. That respect for the freedom of religion, for the freedom of conscience, is as old as our country itself. We recall the text of the First Amendment to our Constitution, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It is that second part, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, that is being challenged today. James Madison, who contributed so strongly to the formulation of the First Amendment, wrote, We hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion, or the duty which we owe our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. The religion, then, of every man must be left to the conviction and the conscience of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. As, loving, as creatures of a loving God, we cannot and do not put aside our faith when dealing with society, the world, or government. And government cannot and should not intrude upon our faith. 
that has been a cornerstone of our experience as Americans and as Catholics. And that's why as Catholics we find ourselves today gravely concerned about the growing number of efforts by government at various levels to, conserve, con to curtail the personal and public exercise of our religion. Please allow me for just a moment to highlight some of those concerns. In recent years, religious entities and individuals have been under increased government pressure regarding the practice of our faith. In January of this year, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously against the Equal o Employment Opportunity Commission in its suit against Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School when the EEOC, in effect, tried to claim the right to determine for that church who qualified to be chosen as one of its ministers. Catholic entities and individual believers in recent years have been forced out of providing various services for the needy, such as, for example, and we have experienced this in our own diocese, the governmental intrusion on our freedom of religion and the placement of children for adoptions. A second example of governmental intrusion into our faith came with the Department of Health and Human Services just this year when it refused to renew previously long-standing contracts with the Catholic bishops providing care and assistance of immigrants because the bishops will not make referrals for abortion services. As a result, the needy suffer, and because we follow our conscience, Catholics are kept from living our faith by helping to make the world better. But there is a new and a present danger. This past February, that same Department of Health and Human Services, a cabinet-level agency, finalized regulations that will have the force of law in the implementation of the new health care system. Those rules will require that almost all private employers nationwide provide health insurance coverage that inc includes contraceptive and sterilization services which are contrary to our Catholic teaching. The religious exemption that accompanied that mandate to violate our teaching and conscience is so narrowly drawn that only institutions which serve primarily persons of their own faith would be considered religious and therefore exempt from the requirement to violate church teaching. Let's think about that. By government imposition, because we go out and serve people of all faiths or no faith at all, our hospitals, our Catholic charities, and our Catholic universities are defined by government to be not Catholic enough to have their consciences respected. The result is clear. We've been given an ultimatum, either to violate our teaching and our consciences, or to leave the arena of public service that flows directly from our faith in Jesus Christ. As someone recently observed, by the standard that is being set, neither Jesus nor Mother Teresa would qualify for the exemption. And we need to be clear about something else. It is not just Catholic institutions that are entangled in these consequences. Other people of faith who seek to serve God and their brothers and sisters will not have their religious rights respected either. And all of this overlooks perhaps the most fundamental focus of religious freedom. The conscience is not only of institutions, but of individuals who for reasons of faith and conviction are morally opposed to the mandate. Individuals too and businesses that wish to follow their consciences will also be coerced by these regulations. The gospel that we've heard this afternoon tells us not just to love those who are of our own number. We are to love all men and women. And our love for them in terms of service, in terms of aid and charity, requires us to reach out and provide the many services and forms of help that are a hallmark of our faith community. As Catholics, we can be nothing but proud of our tradition of helping the poor and that heretofore unfettered ability to love one another as Christ loves us 
is endangered by the proposed mandate. And how strange it is for us as American citizens to have this pressure from our own government, a form of pressure that has no precedent in our history. We have always had the freedom of religion as an unquestioned protection of our social and our personal lives. The challenge of our day was articulated in an admittedly different context by Abraham Lincoln. In his Gettysburg Address, he spoke of our nation as having been conceived in liberty. He said that the United States engaged in a civil war was testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And as we recall, he concluded by urging the government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth. He spoke at a site where men of various creeds and faith gave their lives in a struggle precisely about freedom. But it's the test of each age, including our own, to review, to appreciate, and to defend our liberties, so ensuring that the vision of our country enshrined by our founding fathers shall indeed not perish from the earth, that it will long endure. That's why as Catholics we are celebrating, beginning yesterday and running through the 4th of July, a celebration of the fortnight for freedom. And as a part of that, we are, as Catholics, standing up and standing together to oppose the mandate. It is late, but it is not too late. We are absolutely convinced that our freedom of conscience is at stake in this matter. We hold the nonpartisan high ground in a fight that we did not choose and to be honest, that we do not want. But it has been brought to the doorstep of our institutions and our consciences, and we will not turn away. As Catholics, we're joining together in our prayers, our fasting, our outreach to the HHS and to the administration. The very nature of our faith is to follow Christ and the teaching of the church, where and as far as he bids us to go. And our consciences will not allow us to stop short or to deviate from Christ's teaching because of human decisions, however well-intended they might be. The protections of the Constitution have served us well as Americans and as Catholics for over two centuries. We need now for them again to respect our consciences and allow us to go forward in our service to the world and to each other. May God truly bless all of you in the legal profession and all of you who are here because of your civic duties as you carry out your tasks for our good, for our benefit, for the common good, and for the freedom and justice that is characteristic of this country that we all love. Thank you for coming to be with us today. We pray for you and we pray for the invaluable service to justice and to peace that you all provide in your lives. I would like to offer at this moment a special blessing for all of those who are here, particularly in the context of your civic duties. Might I ask all of those legislators, mayor, the, those associated with the fire and the police, all in any way, could you please stand as we offer this blessing? O God, our Creator, from your provident hand we have received our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You've called us as your people and given us the right and duty to worship you, the only true God and your Son, Jesus Christ. Through the power and working of your Holy Spirit, you call us to live out our faith in the midst of the world, 
bringing the light and the saving truth of the gospel to every corner of society. We ask you to bless these, our judges, lawyers, law enforcement personnel, civic, fire, police, and community leaders and elected officials in vigilance for the gift of religious liberty. Give them the strength of mind and heart to readily defend our freedoms when they are threatened. Give them courage in making our voices heard on behalf of the rights of your church and the freedom of conscience of all people of faith. Grant, we pray, O Heavenly Father, a clear and united voice to all your sons and daughters gathered in your church in this decisive hour in our history of the nation, so that with every trial withstood and every danger overcome, for the sake of our children and grandchildren and all come after us, this great land will always be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, thank you. Please be seated. Please respond, Lord, hear our prayer. For people of faith who fight to preserve religious liberty, during this fortnight for freedom, may the Lord strengthen their resolve to hold firm in their witness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Christians everywhere, that while striving for a life lived in the spirit of the Lord, his grace may protect their faith in times of peace and sustain their fortitude in times of trial. We pray to the Lord. For the many ministries of the people of faith that reveal God's power and love to a broken world, especially through works of mercy, education, health care, community centers, and charitable services, may they enjoy full protection of the law to fulfill their mission. We pray to the Lord. For our Christian communities, trusting in God's grace to save, may we, through the gifts of the Spirit, have the wisdom to know God's will and find courage to stand up and witness to his love. We pray to the Lord. For our nation, that during this fortnight for freedom, all may be encouraged to stand firm on the principles upheld by our founding fathers, liberty and justice for all. We pray to the Lord. Lord. For civil authorities and all those who enact and uphold laws for God's wisdom to guide their decisions to protect religious freedom, freedom and conscience rights for all, we pray to the Lord. For those who suffer physical persecution or moral oppression because of their religious beliefs, may the God of truth and compassion console them in their suffering, we pray to the Lord. Lord for all peoples of the world, that this fortnight for freedom may inspire and encourage all governments to advance and protect religious liberty for all their people, we pray to the Lord. Lord. Thank you for so many gifts that you've given us, particularly in the context of our country. As we pray for our country, we ask you to continue to bless us. Bless us also with the freedom to serve, particularly our brothers and sisters in following you with the freedom of our conscience, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Sanctify, we pray, O Lord, the offerings made here, and cleanse our hearts by the light of the Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. Ascending above all the heavens and sitting at your right hand, he poured out the promised Holy Spirit on your adopted children. Therefore, now and for ages unending, with all the hosts of angels, we sing to you with all our hearts crying out as we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Benedict, our Pope, David, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and who have died. Welcome them to the light of your faith. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the years, we may merit you to be co-heirs of eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Christ. Through him and 
and with him and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. The Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord,
As the bishop said, it has been wonderful to have all of you here. And I know we've been fed spiritually, but perhaps some of you might be hungry in another way. So we would like to invite all of you who are here today to come downstairs with us and join us in a light luncheon. There's room for everybody and food for everybody. Just follow the uh, ushers and they'll tell you where to go uh, to find the stairs down to, the, uh, to where the, the food is being served. If you have trouble uh, and need uh, some assistance on that, you can go around the outside and come around from the back and there won't be any steps. Let us pray. May the outpouring of the Holy Spirit cleanse our hearts, O Lord, and make them fruitful by the inner sprinkling of his dew through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, touch and fill your minds that you be granted wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to be a voice for the voiceless. Amen. 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 May Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, open your eyes and hearts that you may be generous and have compassionate hearts for the poor and the needy. Amen. May Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, enrich your souls that you desire honesty, integrity, and loyalty. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our acts ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.